more rolling in as we go, but I want to just highlight some things that are coming up, things that are going on in the community, and certainly to be a part of that. Great to have you online today, and uh, excited to have you join us from wherever it is you're joining us. We always love to know who you are and where you come from and where you're watching from. I'm going to highlight a couple things uh, coming on. Uh, let me see. Uh, we, we are a week away from Vacation Bible School. Uh, we're a week away. It doesn't start this Monday. It starts the following Monday. And here's the thing. We are now full. Uh, we have taken all the kids that we can take. Uh, we are limiting the number we're doing this year. Uh, but there's a couple of ways you can still help. Uh, if you haven't volunteered, they could still volunteer. But uh, what we're going to do is a work night this coming Wednesday night, uh, June 16th. At 6.30, meet over in the Family Life Center, and what we got to do is set up various rooms in different places, and we would love to have you do help and do that, because it's a lot of work getting set up and prepped, so that it, you know, we're excited about being back in person this year, versus being only online last year, and so if you want to help, and if you can't make that 6.30 time, but you would like to help, uh, talk to Annette because she has some other times that you could come in and, and she'll direct you as to what you're doing. Uh, let me see, June Operation Christmas Child Items. I failed in my word. I told you we would have the link that if you wanted to get, uh, you wanted to get uh, deflated soccer balls with a hand pump and all that, we'll send out an email this week that has that. Maybe we'll see because they're cheaper to buy by the case and maybe there's a number of you that want to buy one or two of those and uh, for the wow items because we've said that is like gold in most of the places where these boxes go. Uh, food collection we're continuing to do. I would encourage you to be a part of that. And then I'm going to remind you of the schedule. J July 4th falls on a Sunday, uh, which that, I know that means a lot of you will be out of town and you'll be traveling around. But for those that are in town, what we're doing is adjusting our schedule. So on Saturday night, we are having uh, Saturday night, we're going to do a cookout, like right outside here. Uh, Jim Cato is bringing a big grill. We're going to do hot, uh, hot dogs, brats.
the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down as your people sing we will rise with you lifted on your wings and the world will One of the things that we celebrate is the gift of baptism, and that's one of those things where Paul talks about it in Romans 6. We're going to talk about living a shallow life versus living a deeper life, and there's nothing deeper than that start that God gives us in the waters of baptism where he says he, he buries us through baptism into, into his death, and he raises us up into new life. And he says through that gift, through that connection to Christ, our old person goes away and a new person rises to live. And so that's what we celebrate, that we are new. There's this transformation happening through Christ in us. So that's what this song is that we're about to sing and we're going to sing about.
right, you can have a seat as we continue now with the children's message, and Miss Annette has that for this morning. All right, good morning, everybody. Morning. morning. It's good to see everybody, and welcome to all those online as well. Today I have some mugs or cups here on my table. I want you to look at them, and I want you to pick out which cup or mug would you want to drink out of. So here's my first one. It's orange and black. I actually got this from Russia a long, long time ago, and I have a set of these. And here's a beautiful blue one that has some gold in it. We got this from Jeff's grandmother, so it comes with a set. All right, here's just like a styrofoam cup, right? I like it, Debbie. Yeah, a styrofoam cup. Here's a nice mug right here that on those like cool nights to have a nice cup of tea and warm up your hands and the rest of your body. Here's my favorite tea mug. This is my favorite. All right. And you know what? We got to have some Disney, right? We're in Florida after all. So a Mickey Mouse one. And then our last one, because we're in church right now, we have Martin Luther nailed it, right? All right. So which one would you pick to drink whatever beverage you might have? So get it in your head, all right? Everybody got it? Don't change your mind. You got it? All right. So we're going to talk about each one of these. Now, this is what I didn't tell you, but it doesn't really matter. I put something inside each of these mugs or cups or whatever. There's something inside here. But you know what? You're just judging from the outside because you don't know what's in it. So let's just see um, how many of you picked my orange one that I got from Russia. Yes, it's so pretty and ornate. Let's see what it has inside of it. I hope it has something good for those who picked it. Oh, my goodness, it has dirty water. That <laughs> wasn't a good one to pick, right? All right, how many of you picked this one right here? No, this one's not Mickey Mouse. Let's see what it is, huh? We'll get to Mickey, that's right. All right, let's see what's in that for all those who picked my blue one. Oh, dirty water. All right, how about my styrofoam one? Who picked that one? There you go. This is what I usually have at work. Let's see what's in there. Dirty water. I think Pastor Jeff picked the styrofoam. I just, I mixed him up today, so I would throw him off. All right, how about my green one? One of my favorites. Oh, nice. Let's see if you got this. Let's see what it is. <gasps> Clean water. Oh, you picked a good one. How about this one? All right, let's see. Do you think it's dirty water? It is. It says dirty water in there. All right, here we go. Mickey Mouse, Florida mug, right? Here we go. Dirty water. <laughs> and even the last one now, we have Martin Luther. Nailed it, baby, right? Here we go. Dirty water. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So anyway, it was really hard. I mean, we couldn't tell what was in each side of these cups or mugs. We could only judge from the outside. And that's just like people, right? We look at them, we can see their outside, but we don't know what's going on in the inside. Guess what? God's the only one that knows that. He knows the real us. Now, I want to read you a little bit about the Esther story, see how much you remember. So we had a king 
And he had this banquet for 180 days, and then he had the second one for seven days, and he had all this beautiful stuff that he wanted everybody to see because it was all about the outward appearance. What was the king's name? King Xerxes. And he had this beautiful wife who was his king, who she had her own banquet, but King Xerxes called her to come because she was so beautiful, she decided not to come, and she was banished from the kingdom, and she was no longer his wife. What was her name, Queen? Vashti. Very good. So those are our two people that we got introduced to last week. Now, King Xerxes, after he lost his wife, he was kind of feeling sorry for himself. So you know what he decided to do? He wanted to have a beauty contest. And he invited all, he had all these women who were beautiful on the outside. And one of those that came was Esther. All right, they came and they had these beauty treatments and spas and all this stuff, eating the right foods. It was all about the outside. That's all King Xerxes was worried about is what people looked like here. Spoiler alert, Esther became King Xerxes' wife, Queen Esther. So just going to talk about more of that in the sermon today. But what I wanted to remind you is that, you know what, however we look on the outside, I mean, we still want to look our best, right? It's what goes on in the inside of us. And that's exactly why God sent his son, Jesus, to transform us or change our hearts. All right, so let's go ahead and pray. Echo prayer, dear God, although others can see our outside appearance, we know that you see everything about us. Through your son, Jesus, help us to be transformed by you on our inside. Amen. Right now, uh, the kids, they've got a team that are going to be helping with Children's Church. So if uh, you've got kids that are wanting to go to Children's Church, you're going to go with Miss Annette, and it looks like Miss Kristen, and, and I don't know who else in the team, but uh, they're heading out. And so they're going to go and be looking at today's topic, and we're going to continue with the sermon right now. So we're continuing Esther, and so I want to welcome you again, and I want to welcome those who are online. I'm going to be asking you some questions that maybe you're going to talk about at your table. I'm going to ask you uh, to kind of go back and forth there, but we're going to explore Esther chapter 2 as the story progresses. But the key question I'm wanting to ask is this. When you look at your life and you want to know what your life is about, would you want somebody to describe you as super shallow or as somebody who goes really deep. Now my guess is if I did the poll, nobody's going to raise their hand and go, I just want to be as shallow as they come. That's, that's my major goal in life, is I just want to be seen as the most shallow person. You know, A few years ago there was the movie, Shallow Hell, of course, which was a whole story about a guy who was definitely pretty shallow, and on the outside that's all he cared about is the looks of the outside, and there was this transformation that happened to uh, the Jack Black character throughout. We're not going to talk more about that, but, but this is my question for today that I want to dig into because that really comes up key. Are we going, hmm, all right, shallow or deep? Are we going shallow or deep? All right, that is the issue. So we're going to get into this story, all right? And I'm going to have you read along with me. And so we're going to read through basically uh, uh, Exodus. 
Esther chapter 2, and we're going to talk a little bit about it, but we're going to start with the very first verse, so I'm asking you to read along with me. Later, when King Xerxes' fury had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what he had decreed about her. All right, this is the NIV, the New International Translation, which I prefer. I like the NIV. Uh, but sometimes we'll use the ESV, English Standard Version, and the way the ESV one starts, it says literally, and this is what the Hebrew says, after some time. Okay, we don't go around going, hey, see ya after some time. We say see ya later. Okay, so, but after some time is significant because from a historical standpoint, we know who King Xerxes is. We also know what are the main events of his life. <clears throat> I need something different here. Uh, things of his life. And we know that most likely when he kind of said goodbye to Vashti and it had all those parties and all that was the year 483 B.C. We also know that most likely when Esther is crowned queen is in 479 B.C. Remember B.C. it's counting down instead of counting up. So if um, after some time would be significant between 483, 479 is how long? Four years. Okay, so the question becomes, what happened? Why did it take so long? What went down? Now, if you were here and you were paying attention last week, I told you that the whole point of the 180-day long party had nothing to do with just having a good time. It had everything to do with a kingdom that stretched all the way from India down into North Africa and trying to bring all those people together and get them on board to go and wage war against Greece. Remember I told you that, that Xerxes' father had tried and failed? And now Xerxes wants to do the very same thing. He wants to say, man, look at this wealth. I can support an army. We're going to go and we're going to expand our kingdom that will now include all of Greece and even beyond that. The problem is, 483, 479, in between that time period, he did that, and he came back with his tail between his legs. He got whooped. He got whooped. Barely survived. And their army comes back decimated. So it's not gone well. And he gets back. And, and here's the way I like to read this. I think there's moments in all of our lives, and I think they often happen when things have blown up, or when we've stumbled, or when we failed, where we are faced with a choice. Am I just gonna kinda just continue down the same shallow path, or is this a moment when I'm gonna realize it's time for a change? I want something deeper. I want something more significant. I can come back from this. I believe for a moment, Xerxes was facing that decision. Am I going to continue to be shallow or am I going to go deeper? And so he's like debating that because he's thinking about, oh, that whole episode of Vashti. Now I'm four years different with that. I now see that the whole war thing didn't work out. And, I, and he's just kind of like maybe feeling a little sense of regret. And then, ha, huh, that's not what happens though. Then his advisors start talking. And so they say this. Read it with me. Then the king's personal attendants proposed, let a search be made for beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint commissioners in every province of his realm to bring all these beautiful young women into the harem at the citadel of Susa. Let them be placed under the care of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women, and let the beauty treatments be given to them. Then let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. And this advice pleased the king. All right, so he's faced with this thing. Am I going to continue on my shallow path, or am I going to come deeper? Am I going to realize who I've been, the mistakes I've made? And then all of a sudden, his advisors say, hey, I got a plan. We're just going to go out and we're going to bring hundreds of beautiful women for you to, for your enjoyment. And he says, I think I'll stay shallow. 
That's what he says. I mean, there's nothing deep about this plan, but it's all about pleasure. It's all about his ego. It's all about stroking that. And so that's what's going to unfold. And the question becomes for you and I, as we start exploring Esther 2, is what do we want our story to be? All of us, nobody is going to sit there and say, I want to be the shallowest person you've ever met. And yet, all of us tend to meander towards the shallow end of the pool instead of going out into the deep waters. So we're going to unfold this a little more. Most settle for beauty that runs skin deep, shallow. All right? All right, this one is, is a couple slides. I'm going to read it for you, okay, rather than you read, but kind of follow along with me. Now there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai, son of Jer, the son of Shimshi, the son of Kish, who was carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, among those taken captive with Jehoiakim, king of Judah. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought, brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This young woman, who was also known as Esther, had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. When the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, many young woman, women were brought to the citadels of Susa and put under the care of Haggai. Esther also was taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai, who had charge of the harem. She pleased him and won his favor. Immediately, he provided her with her beauty treatments and special food. He assigned to her seven female attendants selected from the king's palace and moved her and her attendants into the best place in the harem. Okay, so this is what's happening. All right, so I want to give you a little more detail. This is actually from archaeologists. They have done the explorations in Susa. They have uncovered, they know the, the, the game plan, the, the whole architectural layout of the king's palace. That's what you're seeing on the screen. Okay, now as you're looking at this, down at the bottom, uh, about half of that picture, there is kind of like a pinkish, fleshish color, maybe. Uh, and it says right down there, harem. And so you're thinking, okay, I'm looking at that. Looks a little bit like my house out in Ocala. Um, until you realize the measurements. You see that pinkish, fleshish area? Um, that is over a football and a half long. This is not some little room. This is not this room. Uh, it looked more like this. Do you see the building at the back side? They've recreated that. Recreated. That's the massive complex of where the harem would have stayed. This is from the other side. This is in another city where they've actually built the building. And so this is some of the way it was laid out. It's a fabulous kind of palace. But I think we can easily get lured into thinking, oh my, like a, a year-long spa? And, you know, like a year-long of the best foods? I mean, this is like, oh, how bad could that be? Well, let's not forget what was at stake. When those women were gathered in and those who do such things have worked out the figures, and I'm told, I have no way of double-checking, so I'm going to go by that, they estimate that at the time the Persian Empire had about 25 million people in it. And they do the figures and they assume that when you wandered and you moved, moved that all down and from you know, India down to North Africa, and if you're bringing the best of the best in that, again, very shallow view of it, there was probably about 400 women that he had to choose from. And so it's really easy for us to kind of picture it in 2021 20, details, and you're almost picturing, you know, this great big kind of uh, huge uh, bachelor thing, you know, going, and you're picturing it as the bachelor thing. No, 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 no. That's not what this is. This is not lining up the women to see what talents they have and see what this and that and all this. This is, from a woman's standpoint, you are going to be used. Night after night, can 
contestant one comes in. They have physical. She's sent back to the harem next night, number two, number three, number four, number five, and on through the list. So as a woman actually reading this beyond just the, hey, that would be nice to be pampered for a year in a spa, what was coming was anything but pleasant. There's no relationship here. There's no, hey, let's go out on a date and get to know each other. There is, you show up at the bedroom at this time and you perform. And then, and all those women, all the ones that didn't get selected, they would remain in that building the rest of their lives. Because they had been with the king, they were no longer good they were too good for any other man, so they couldn't get married, they couldn't have children. The rest of their life they were cared for, but it was a very lonely existence. This is the story of Esther. And as we explore this chapter too, the thing becomes this, there's this side question. Before I asked you if you're gonna be shallow or deep, now I'm gonna ask you a second question. If you are a follower of Christ, we use this kind of language around the church, that you're to be in the world, but not part of it, okay? You're supposed to be something different as followers of Christ from just the general culture around you. But how do you do that? What does that look like? Now, I mean, people take different approaches. For example, if you're a Hasidic Jew in New York City, how do you know when you spot a Hasidic Jew? They got the beard, they got the outfit, they got that. If you go to Lancaster County in Pennsylvania, you're gonna encounter people that have very specifically said, this is how we're gonna be in the world but not of it. How? It's the horse and, and buggy, it is a very plain outfits, it is the life of the Amish. We're not gonna use modern technology that somehow, some way, the 1800s is the way God meant it to be for here on out. So, you're a follower of Christ in 2021. You're still called to be in the world, but not of it. What does that look like? How do you? Is it a matter of, I'm going to dress different? I'm going to live different. Well, how different? You're only going to be like my grandparents in Kentucky, they wouldn't have TV as a kid. I mean, they didn't get TV until they were in their 70s, I think, because that was the devil's toy box. So they were going to be known, and, and in fact, I can remember conversations them having that they would drive down the road, and people that had, you know, this is before cable, that had those antennas on the roof, oh, they'd given in to Satan. You know, that was their view. How do we do this? See, that's the question mark. And here's the thing. We'll look at the story of Esther, and we look at Mordecai, and we look at Esther, and we tend to say, oh, these are going to be the heroes of the story. And I'm not saying they're not. Well, I am going to say this. The only hero in the Bible is always God. Nobody else is the hero. You know, I know that's hard to hear because we probably went through Sunday school. Here's the hero of the faith and the hero of the faith. The hero is ultimately God. But he's going to use Mordecai, he's going to use Esther, but at this point, are they all that different? I mean, as you're looking through Esther, the story, there's a couple differences. One is, she has a Jewish name. It's Hadassah. All right? Hadassah is the Jewish word for myrtle. She also has a Persian name, Esther, that we know it by. It actually comes from the goddess Ishtar, her star. So the name she bears in Persia is actually named after a false god. Mordecai, we don't know what his Jewish name was. We know what his Persian name was. It was Mordecai, which came from the god Marduk. So it would seem to me that we could certainly make the argument that they have gotten pretty cozy with the culture. There's, and it's interesting, as you read this, and if you'll read people that are writing about it, you've got Christian writers, you've got Jewish writers, some of whom, 
you know, want to say, oh, they're such heroes. And then there's others that go, wait a minute. They seem to have compromised themselves to the culture around them. They've taken on Persian names. There's no comment about when she goes into the, uh, the palace that she's asking for a nice kosher diet. None of that's there. And in fact, it's very different than, let's say, you read the book of Daniel. You read the book of Daniel, and they're also in a foreign land. They're serving under a foreign king. And the king says, no more praying to any other god except for me for the next uh, whatever time period. And what does Daniel do? Does he go, oh, okay, I can, I can get into that. I'll just kind of slip it under my breath kind of thing. No, he goes home, he opens up the windows so that everybody can hear and everybody can see, and he hits his knees and he prays to the god Yahweh. And he gets arrested and thrown into a lion's pit because of it. Or there's later on in that same book, there's a story about like three guys, remember them? And then there's a new king and he's made a 90 foot golden statue and says for the next 30 days, you can only bow down to this statue. And those three guys, anybody remember their names? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. None of them will bow. And they get thrown into a fiery furnace. And now we get to Mordecai and Esther, and the king is saying some pretty, I mean, let's face it, you're going to be treating women like they're nothing more than property. Mordecai doesn't send her away. He doesn't send her to Judea to get her and free her from this. It doesn't say she went kicking and screaming. It's very nondescript. These things happen. These things happen. How do we live in the world but not of it? Can God only use people that make such a bold stand? Or is this a story where they're not quite there yet, but as time progresses and circumstances get more desperate, finally they come around. I don't know. How do we do this? And that gets us to this idea that God is able to bring about a deeper beauty. A deeper beauty. And so the story continues. Read this one with me. Now the king was more attracted to Esther than, more than to any other women. And she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all of his nobles and officials. He proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts with royal liberality. Something changes. Okay, this is one of these moments where you see the fingerprints of God. Here is all of these women, and, and I don't know, I have never had such experience. I, I guess you'd have to ask Hugh Hefner back in his day before he died, maybe. I don't know, that's the only thing, person I can compare it to. But here's my thinking. One nameless person after another, how would anybody stand out? It's just one physical act after another, and another person, and another person, and another person, and another person. It's just one cup after another that I'm drinking out of. But somewhere along the line, Esther stands out. There's something going on here. There's a, a deeper beauty. There's something that he is drawn to. And she becomes queen. It's a deeper beauty. There's something happening. And, and God is going to use that, even though his name is not mentioned. There is something going on. I want to bring up one other story. And I'm going to ask you this question. How many of you have been watching? Um, there is the, a series uh, that's available through the internet. On, it's, season one's on YouTube. It's easier to get it off the app. How many of you have been watching The Chosen? Wow. You guys are missing out. The Chosen is awesome. 
Now, I will tell you, it takes liberties because it fills in the backstory of the Gospels. But it's phenomenal. Uh, season one ends with uh, episode seven has the calling of Matthew. And I'm thinking about Matthew. And Matthew is, from a, a worldly standpoint, it depends on which line you stand. For the, for the faithful Jews, he is as ugly as it gets. Not because of his complexion or anything along that line, but he is a traitor to the people. All he's done is sold out his people in order to get rich, and so he is despised. He's not just tolerated. He's not just, he is despised. And yet one day Jesus comes by and calls him. Now, they project some of the backstory in that, which is part of the brilliance of the chosen. But here's the thing. Jesus didn't check out his resume and go, man, you didn't live a good enough life. I would love to call you, but sorry. You did this and you did this and you did this. He just calls him, follow me. And Matthew's life changes. And there is a deeper beauty that begins to flow from within him. Within him. Episode 8 is the woman at the well. And as episode 8 ends season 1, Jesus reveals himself to her. She is a woman who is seen as ugly. Her life has just fallen apart. She has made wrong choices. She has been abused. She has been <coughs> abused in so many ways to where no one will spend time with her. She's out at noon bringing in water at the heat of the day because none of the other women will have anything to do with her. And yet it's to her that Jesus, for the first time, says, I'm the Messiah. He's going for a deeper beauty. This, uh, I don't follow a lot of TV, but I did watch this on the internet, and because we are online streaming, and I don't want to break uh, copyrights, but I'm going to put a picture up. If you're following America's Got Talent, this was a beautiful story from this last week. Um, Jane... Uh, she sings under the name uh, Nightbird with an E on the end. Nightbird with an E. Jane is from Zanesville, Ohio. Zane has, body is filled with cancer. Uh, she has cancer in her liver and her spine and lungs. According to her, the doctors give her about a 2% ch chance of survival. But she came on the show and she didn't lead with the cancer. Instead, she led with a song. A beautiful song. I, uh, after that, it, it was so moving that I, I wanted to explore who she is. She's a graduate of Liberty University, a Christian university. Not without controversy, but it's a Christian university. And she wrote a blog article that she said, Prayers from the Floor. And she's trying to describe her relationship with God. You know, obviously she's cute. But from anybody doing a PET scan, it's ugly. I mean, she's got cancer, and it, it's lighting up. It's an ugly situation. Somehow connected to that, her husband left her. And she's talking about just, you know, everything's falling apart. She's laying on the floor, literally laying on the bathroom floor trying to figure this out. And yet she finds herself calling out to God for strength to just get through, to just get through day by day by day. And she comes, and I will tell you, if, I, if it wasn't infringing on copyright, I would play it right now, but I would really encourage you to go onto YouTube and just type in uh, Nightbird, um, America's, or America's Got Talent, and you'll, you'll be blessed. There's a beauty. Are you wanting to be shallow? 
We want to stay on the shallow end because Jesus is always inviting us into something deeper. And it's not about our efforts. It's not about our strength. It's about the same Jesus who came into the world and sought out the weak and the broken and the hurting and those devalued by a culture that only sees the outside. Keep in mind, please, I think there's sometimes that we, we get this amnesia, selective amnesia that says, if I just reached a certain income level, my problems would all go away. And that's just not true. Or we, we go along and we'll say, wow, you know, oh, I look at that, you know, this, this woman, she looks like a, a model, or this man, he looks like he could just star, uh, you know, be, come off the pages of GQ or something. And, and if you've got that kind of look, my goodness, your life has to be easy. It's not true. Pain knows no certain class. Suffering isn't limited to certain income levels of below or certain levels of beauty. What we need is a God who reaches and transforms us from the inside out. It takes the dirty water from within us and purifies it, washes us as his own. That is our call. And that's what we receive in Christ. That's what his love and his death and his resurrection is all about. So am I going deeper or staying shallow? What's the beauty that I seek? Secondly, for next week, we're going to continue on with Esther 3, kind of the end of chapter 2 into chapter 3. If you're reading along with the Donna Snow book, and I am out of those books, but if you're reading along with, we're going to be doing lesson 3. And I certainly invite you. We're doing an Esther study on Tuesdays, kind of going deeper into each of these messages, deeper into the study, deeper into the Donna Snow book. And uh, we're doing that both in person in COC and online. So this is the first time we've ever offered a class in person and online at the same time. So that's kind of interesting in and of itself. But as the praise group comes forward, um, we want to use this song as a way of uh, just going a little deeper. I think this is a song that really helps us kind of plummet the depths of what it means to have a Savior, what it means. And so, uh, again, we're, we'll receive gifts and offerings, not now. We'll do that on the way out. Uh, that would be fine. But what I'm really hoping and praying is that God's nudging your heart away from the shallow end and to knowing something deeper. Let's sing. You are way maker. 
into the deeper waters of your love and your mercy and grace. The scriptures say, how will we be known? How will we be known to be your followers? It doesn't say it's going to be by our dress. It doesn't say it's going to be by our income level. It doesn't say it's going to be by our buildings. It says that we are going to be known by how we love with your love and how we love one another and how we love those who are hurting and those who are wounded and those who feel abandoned by the world, this is how we will be known. It's a work in your lives, we pray. Oh, Holy Spirit, fill us in ways that we reach out. But we pray, we pray for those who are hurting among us this day. We pray over Peg Green and Winnie, a one-year-old who is dealing with chemo treatments. We pray for Shelby recovering, Don and Robin Levy's brother-in-law, Pete. We pray for Sarah recovering and beginning treatments for brain cancer. For Betty, for Don Kaufman's granddaughter, Kylie, who's able to be back at home but faces so many health issues. For James' husband, whose surgery is pushed off till July and yet dealing with very real crippling pain right now. For Terry Terman with a leg infection. For Dennis Dale, diagnosed and, and dealing with that diagnosis now. For Tracy, who will be going in for surgery for gallbladder this Wednesday. For all the others that we lift up right now in our hearts and minds, Lord. Use the medical people, those men and women of 
are so gifted that you've placed and your fingerprints of healing are all over them, we pray. Be with them and in their care of these, our brothers and sisters, our friends in Christ. Lord, be with us as Vacation Bible School begins in a week from now. And we have that opportunity to just love on kids and, and share the joy of knowing they are treasured, Lord. They are your treasured sons and daughters of the King. We give you thanks, Lord, today. We give you thanks that Hannah, the six-year-old, uh, who just had another scan, and it is all clear. No cancer has returned, and we're thankful for that. We're, we're thankful for today in the earlier service, Tyler and Madison, two uh, a young man and young woman that we called from Lutheran East in Cleveland who are now coming here and going to be serving within our high school and middle school. And when they get ready to get married on June 26, we pray for that wedding right now as they move things down this direction and, and you continue to use them in the ministry here. We pray for your blessing upon them. And we pray for the family of David Wright, for Judy and the family that gathered together on Friday and said their earthly goodbyes. We thank you for the man of God that David was and the holding on to your promise. So as we gather here as your people, even now, we are one family, one people. As we pray together the prayer that you've taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand up and hear these words of blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance, his peace upon you and just let that peace overflow in your life. Amen. So whatever it is you're facing this day, whatever it is that's going before, whether it is surgery whether it is going back to work, whether it is challenges in finances, relationships, whatever it is. Here, I want to remind you and send you out with this song. The battle belongs to the Lord. Let's sing. You see my victory When all I see is the mountain You see a mountain move And as I walk through the shadow Your love surrounds me There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. Here we go. Everybody sing. Here we go. So there's a
can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the the Lord.